Well, Buddha will lay so mounted to the DVD drive of our virtual machine in this lab. Now, because our disc attached to this machine has absolutely nothing on it, as soon as this machine fires up, it's going to launch us into the Windows installation wizard. Performing a manual installation is very simple. There's only a few decisions we need to make, and the wizard will do the rest. But it's also very time consuming because it is a manual process. It's going to require us to be here to walk through each one of these steps in the installation wizard. Imagine you've been tasked with standing up a whole data center worth of servers. Doing that manually would take you weeks, if not longer. So this is why we have tools out there like WDS, Windows Deployment Services, and SCCM, System Center Configuration Manager. These tools allow us to perform mass deployments and automate a lot of the decisions you're about to see here. But we need to learn how to walk before we can run. And performing a few manual installations will give you insight into what you'll be automating when it comes time to do mass deployments. So let's get started here. The opening screen, very simple. Choose your language, time and currency, format, keyboard or input method, and hit next. And then choose install now. And that brings us to our first major decision. What edition, standard or data center in our case, and what installation option within that edition, server core or the desktop experience, do you want to install? We're going to be working with data center throughout all of our labs here. And for this lab, we want to choose the desktop experience. So we're going to choose the very last option here, data center edition with the desktop experience, and choose next. Next up, we need to accept the EULA the end user license agreement. So make sure you give this a read from top to bottom. I'm just kidding, you don't need to do that. Just check the box and hit next. Next up, we need to choose an installation type. Is this going to be an in-place upgrade or a clean installation? An in-place upgrade requires that a previous version of Windows is already running on this machine. It is not for us, so our only option here is going to be a clean installation. And by the way, we have a nugget dedicated to upgrading and migrating to server 2016. So we'll look at the specifics in that nugget and talk about when you would perform an in-place upgrade over a clean installation. But for this nugget here, let's go ahead and choose our second option, and that's going to bring us to our final step of the wizard. Where do you want to install Windows 2? This screen is going to list all of the disks attached to the machine that Windows can see. Now, if this list is empty or there's a disk that doesn't show up in this list, that means Windows doesn't have the appropriate driver to see and work with that disk. And that's where these first two buttons come into play. So what you would do if you ever run into that situation is first acquire the driver. If you have it lying around, great. If you don't, you can probably download it from the manufacturer's website. Pop that on to some removable media, like a DVD-ROM or a USB stick. Plug that into your machine, then hit this load driver button and browse to it. Once you're out of this screen, then you'd come back here, hit the refresh button, which will rescan all the drives. And since Windows at that point will have the driver, it should show up in this list as an option to install Windows to. Now, in our lab environment here, we have one empty 40 gigabyte disk with no partitions on it. If your disks have partitions, those would show up here as well. And anytime you chose a partition, these three buttons would light up, giving you an opportunity to work with those partitions. Now, if we were to choose next right now, it would actually use this entire disk, and it would create two partitions, a system partition, as well as a primary partition, which is where Windows will go. And you can actually see this if we hit the new button. And let's say that we didn't want to use all of that unallocated space. Maybe we would just wanted roughly 35 gigs. We can type in 35,000 megabytes, hit apply, hit OK to this screen, just letting us know it also uh, will need to create a system partition. And when you hit OK, you will see that it will come back here with two partitions. So there's our system partition. Here's our primary partition where Windows will go. And here's the rest of that unallocated space. Now, check this out. I hit a partition, and look at that. These buttons light up. If you choose unallocated space, you can choose to create a new partition. Let's say that, you know what? We did want that six gigabytes thrown in here. Well, we could choose our partition there, hit extend, and now we can enter the total size, hit apply, and it's going to then, after we hit OK here, wrap the rest of that space into our second partition. Now, if this partition had data on it and we wanted to start fresh, this is where the format button comes into play. We could simply hit format and it'll blow away any data on that partition. I'm going to go ahead and hit delete and hit OK. And it will also delete our system partition and we're back to where we were. And again, we're going to get the same exact result here when we hit next. It's going to create that system partition and then use the rest of that space for the primary partition. So we're good here. Let's go ahead and hit next. And that's that. Now we just need to wait about five to 10 minutes for installation to complete. So pause me, let your installation finish, and I'll meet you back here when we're all set. And we're done. Installation is completed successfully. It performed a couple of reboots. And the last thing we need to do here is supply a password for the local built-in administrator account. So you can enter it in here, or I'm going to use the lab controls to paste in our password and then also confirm it. Once we're done, we can go ahead and hit finish. 
and now we can log in for the first time. So once again, I'm going to use the lab controls here to send a control delete over. Enter or paste in the password that we just supplied and hit log in. Once the desktop loads up, server manager will launch automatically. This is our graphical utility for managing this server. We'll come back to here in a second. First, let's just configure the UI real quick here. We're going to change our resolution so we can see everything in one view here. I'm going to right click on the desktop, head into display settings, head down here to advanced display settings, and we're going to drop down our resolution here. And I'm just going to change this to 1280 by 720 and hit apply. There we go. Much better. Now, another thing we're going to do here is I like to hide all this stuff down in the lower right to remove the distraction. So I'm going to right click on the taskbar, head into settings. And from here, we're going to scroll down to the bottom. I'm going to choose to turn system icons on or off. So I'm just going to turn all of these to off. That looks good. And now this is what our UI will look like going forward for all of our lab environments. We're also going to run BG info up here. So you'll always know what machine you're on. It'll be burned into the desktop. Another thing I like to do here is server manager is not on the taskbar by default. So let's give that a right click and pin it to the taskbar. Now we're ready to perform some post installation configuration tasks. Some of the most common things you'll do once you get a server up is get it on the network by supplying its IP information. And a common thing to do on the server side is to give it a static IP address. So we'll do that first. We also need to give it a name so we can easily identify it on the network by name. And we often name our machines based on its purpose, the roles that that machine is running. And we'll also configure the firewall. Now, in our lab environment, we're just going to turn the firewall completely off so it doesn't get in the way. And finally, you'll always want to perform a Windows update, especially in this day and age. We want to make sure that our machines are properly patched and updated. Now, we're going to do all of this using the GUI in this lab, specifically here, Server Manager. Once we get into our server core nuggets, we'll look at how to do all of this stuff only entirely using the command line and PowerShell. So back in Server Manager, let's go ahead and choose Local Server here in the left-hand nav. This will give us a nice consolidated view of all those common configurable points. Let's begin by getting this machine onto the network. Server Manager will list all the available network interface cards on this machine. We have one named Ethernet. And if we choose this link, it's going to launch us into our network connections. Now, by default, it's set up for automatic IP address assignment via DHCP. We do not have a DHCP server on the network, so we were assigned what's known as in a PIPA, an automatic private IP address. In fact, we can see that IP address if we right click on the start button, launch the command prompt, and type in IP config. Look at that. Anything that starts with 169.254 is known as in a PIPA. So we're all by itself on our own network with no network connectivity or internet access. In fact, if we try to ping google.com here, it's going to say, nope, sorry, can't find it. So we actually have a private network out there. Let's get this machine onto that network. Back in Network Connections, if we right-click on our Network Interface card and head down to Properties and then choose IPv4, you can double-click on it or you can click on it and hit the Properties button down here. It'll launch us into our IP configuration. You can see we are set up for DHCP, Automatic IP Address Assignment. Let's assign this with a static IP address on that 192.168.1 network. And let's give this one that 1.100. If you hit Tab or head down here to the second field that automatically enter the Class C subnet mask, then for a default gateway, let's type in 192.168.1.1. Let's also enter a DNS server here for external name resolution so we can hit the internet of a Google public DNS server, 8.8.8.8. Now we can hit OK and hit Close here. We can also close out of our network connections and hit Refresh in Server Manager, and we should see our static IP here. Now let's fire up the command prompt one more time here. Right-click on the Start button, head up to the command prompt, type in IP config, and we should see our IP address. Excellent. Now if we attempt to ping google.com, it should work. Look at that. We are now on our private network, and we have internet access. Next up, let's configure the firewall. So in Server Manager, you will see Windows Firewall. We're currently hooked up to the public profile. There's three profiles, public, private, and domain. We're not on a domain yet, so we're only going to have access to the public and private profile. So if we click on this link, it's going to launch the Windows Firewall applet, which lives in the control panel. If we choose Turn Windows Firewall on or off, we're going to turn this off for both of these profiles and hit OK. We can close out of this. Once again, hit Refresh in Server Manager, and now we should see that the firewall is off. Now, another thing you want to do is perform a Windows update. And you can do this manually here by clicking this link, which will launch you into settings, and you can hit that button right there. Keep in mind that it'll take a while to download all the latest patches, hotfixes, and updates for Server 2016. And down the road, later on in this course, I'm going to show you how we can work with WSUS, Windows Server Update Services, which is, again, a tool that we'll use to centrally manage and mass deploy 
these updates to all the machines in our network. Now, the final thing we need to do here is give our machine a name, a meaningful name that describes what this machine will be. So is this going to be a database server, a file server, a web server, a domain controller? You can see by default here, we're going to get this randomly generated name, which isn't going to mean anything if somebody sees this on the network. So if we click on this, it's going to launch us into system properties. We can come down here and choose change. And we're eventually here going to install IIS onto this machine. So this is going to be a web server. So let's name it accordingly here. How about WebNug? Web-Nug. Perfect. We hit OK here. It's just going to let us know that we're going to need to restart this machine before that takes effect. So hit OK to this message. Hit Close here and choose Restart Now. And we're back. Let's re-log into this machine. I'll send a control I'll delete over there, paste the password in, and log in. Once the desktop loads up, Server Manager will launch automatically. Now if we choose Local Server, we should see our brand new computer name of WebNug in place. The last thing we need to do here is give our machine a purpose. And we're going to do that by installing a server role so it lives up to its name WebNug here. And we can do that by dropping down the Manage menu and choosing Add Roles and Features. This will launch us in to the Add Roles and Features wizard. Give the Before You Begin a quick read through here and then choose Next. We're going to be performing a role-based or feature-based installation, so we can go ahead and stick with the default here and choose Next. And this is where we choose what machine we want to target. And I'll show you when we get into remote management how we can add multiple machines into Server Manager, manage them remotely. But this is where we would choose the machine that we want to target. So yeah, we can perform remote installation of these server roles and features. The only downside here is you can only do one machine at a time, and that's where PowerShell comes into play because we can perform mass installations across multiple machines using PowerShell. We're good here, though, except the default, which is WebNug. You can also see the destination server up here and go ahead and choose Next. Next up is the big one. These are all the server roles that come with Server 2016. So this is where we would choose one or more roles that would define the primary purpose of this machine. So what is this machine's purpose in life? Is it going to be an Active Directory-based server, a DHCP server, maybe a DNS server, maybe both of those? Is it going to be a Hyper-V host, maybe a print server, or what we're going to choose here, a web server. Also, if we scroll down a little bit here, we'll also see Windows Deployment Services, and there's Windows Server Update Services. Now, many of these larger server roles, again, have role services associated with them, which are those underlying components that make up the server role. Some of the smaller ones, like DHCP or DNS, aren't going to have any role services associated with them. They only perform one function. In fact, if we choose DHCP server here, and by the way, choosing many of these server roles will pop up in this screen, which says, do you want to also include the administration tools, the remote server administration tools? If you hit Add Features, it'll actually automatically check the features, and it's showing you where they live in the feature list. We'll head over there in a second. But I'm going to go ahead and choose Yes, Add Features. So doing that, just simply added a DHCP server overview page here to the wizard. If this had role services associated with it, they would be listed underneath. In fact, if we head back to server roles here, and let's choose print and document services, for instance. And I'll go ahead and choose yes to add these features as well. Now, underneath print and document services, the overview page, we get role services. So what do we want this to be? A print server, a scan server, an internet printing server, or all of those. So role services, again, are just the underlying components that make up that server role. So in this case, you can just think of the server role as simply a grouping. Now, let's head back up here to server roles, and let's go ahead and uncheck print and document services and uncheck DHCP server. Again, we're going to turn this in to a web server. So let's scroll down here, and let's choose web server, which will install internet information services. We also want the management tools associated with it, so we'll go ahead and choose add features. And now, let's hit next to move on to features. So again, features don't define a server. They augment, and they can add tools and support to existing server roles. In fact, check it out, we have containers, something we'll talk about heavily in this course. We could add container support here onto this machine. We could add failover clustering, something else we'll be talking about in this course for high availability. Maybe we're spinning up a farm of web servers that we want to be highly available. We could add failover clustering to all of those machines. As we scroll down here, we'll also see remote server administration tools. Notice we've got a checkbox there. If we expand this, check it out. Even though we uninstalled DHCP and print and document services, it's still left its features in here. So we could uncheck those individually or uncheck role administration tools and they'll go away. But this is where that, that dialog box that popped up when you chose a server role comes into play because if you choose add features, it's going to check the tools associated with that feature here. So here's where you can manage them. And as we scroll down further here, you'll also see some of the built-in features like PowerShell and Windows Defender. So this is where if we expand this here, you'll see that we have PowerShell 
5.1 and the integrated scripting environment, all things we'll be getting quite heavily into throughout the course. But this looks good. We don't need any extra features here. So let's go ahead and hit next. And now we're back to our server role. There's our overview page. If we hit next, we can choose all of the role services that we want to include in IIS. A web server, we can turn this into an FTP server. And its management tools are actually implemented as a role service here for IIS. So we'll get the IIS management console included. We're good with the defaults. So let's go ahead and hit next. And we're done. So the confirmation screen here will just give you a quick overview of everything that you're installing. If that feature requires a restart, you can have it do so automatically. We're good though. So let's go ahead and install and just wait a few minutes for this to complete. Once it's done, you should get an installation succeeded message. We can hit close. And now we can see IIS is a role. It gets its own group over here in the left-hand nav. We can also see if we drop down the tools menu, we should have our management tool here, Internet Information Services Manager. If we launch this, I'm just going to go ahead and maximize it here, expand our WebNug machine, we should have a default website in here. So if we expand sites, there's the default website. If we head down here to content view, here it is. It's just an HTML page referencing this image. Let's test it out. Let's fire up a browser. In the address bar, enter localhost. And look at that.